part of our Sunday school class this morning was to rejoice in the truth. And it's funny that we had an issue of the truth. Wednesday night we had a Bible study. And I kind of thought of that, that somebody came into the church and tried to give some things that were, I didn't really feel were biblical. And it really troubled me. And some of you were there at the Bible study. And it's been on my mind, so I kind of turned the other way and laid this. I feel like God laid this on my heart. I'm hoping that's true. But here's a real life example of the question is, are there still apostles and prophets in the church? Capital A. We're talking about, you know, the Old Time Testament prophets and uh, apostles in the New Testament. Here's an example. First of all, there was a man that came from another church, a, a, a kind of a word of faith church that wanted to join with us and fill members. So I went to a meeting and I found out that they were absorbing these churches and then calling their own and putting their own theology in it. Another man that had kind of similar ideas that he thinks there's prophets and apostles still today, and he told me, I'm not a pastor. He said, you are a prophet. And we think that you're, we need to use you. You're right next to the apostle that they've identified in this area. That really bothered me. And so I thought of an example. We're supposed to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, now you can have truth, but without the spirit, it's brutality. Jesus was full of grace and truth. Now, you can have grace without truth. That's a license to sin. You can have truth without grace. And that's legalism. When you have grace and truth, you have the perfect balance of what Jesus brought. He was full of grace and full of truth. And that's what I propose to bring to you today, truth about this new movement that's underway, that's starting to absorb other churches and infiltrating other churches with a doctrine that is contrary to what I find in the Bible. We talked about it Wednesday night. If it's not in the scripture, you can tell me something as a chapter and verse. Somebody comes up and they say, I have a word of knowledge for you. What does that mean? I have a word. Here is knowledge. So I, and sometimes people will give you an idea that there's something God spoke to me. Here's an example. One guy who was supposedly a prophet, this is several years ago, and this is a real example, came up to a guy and he knew he was wanting to buy a house. This guy came up, God spoke to me about you and you're buying a house. It's not a good idea. The guy didn't buy the house because somebody said, well, God spoke to me and told me this. This is a real example. This was 10 years or more ago. The guy says, you know, I wasn't really sure. I had uncertainty, so I decided not to buy it. Move forward 10 years. 10 years later, the young man, 10 years older, he had to finally let, settle in living in a trailer, and he bought the trailer. He couldn't find the house that was right for him. He couldn't get financing and all that. So 10 years later, he's living in a house uh, in a trailer, paying for a, a trailer that is broken down, the heating and air conditioning was out, the, the compressor went out, the floor's kind of given in, trailers don't have a, a, a great age. So he was living in a trailer that was falling apart, making payments on it still, he'd have six more years before he paid it off. The funny thing is about the house, the payments that he would, by now he would have had the house paid for, and it would have been clean, uh, he would have been out of debt, free and clear. So this man that said he was a prophet, speaking for God, misled this man into becoming now in debt because he was wrong. He had a word of God. He said God spoke to him. I said God still speaks to us, but it is right here. I cannot speak for God for what you should do or what I think you should do. Now there's counseling. That's a whole other issue. So we hear a modern day prophets today, and they're prophesying about things that are outside of the word of God. It's a dangerous place to be, to me. What does the Bible say about prophets? Uh, what is true? How do you validate somebody that's a prophet or an apostle? Warning signs. When somebody comes up to you, and I've had people say this. One guy came up to me and recently that is at another church that's trying to work with other churches. He says, you know, God spoke to me that, that you need to have more reassurance. You need to calm yourself down and trust and wait on God. And I says... How do you know my heart? I, I thought, that's interesting. Because I thought I was being patient and I'm calm and, and I love to serve God. So how did God speak to you orally? Did he speak to you from someone else? Uh, another warning thing. I think you need to, 
fill in the blank. Now there's a difference between wise counseling because there's safety in a multitude of counselors. Right. But then there's a different issue when somebody speaks for God. For I'm, God told me to tell you. Okay, I'm going to try to contact Jack. So I'm going to use Tom. Tom, would you call Jack to give me a message? So for me, see how ridiculous that is. Would God use a third party to communicate to you by using someone else? It seems utterly ridiculous. And I couldn't find it in the Bible. You don't see this happening in the Bible. Here's a good sign. You were thinking about buying a house and, and the Christian friend comes up to you, you know what, I can get you some first-time financing. I think it's a good idea. You know, he's, it's funny, I was just thinking the same thing. There's confirmation. See, that's not God speaking to somebody for someone to you, but it's confirmation, you know. Yeah, I agree, that makes perfect sense. You know, so see the difference between the two? Somebody can give up your counsel and says, you know, I, I might do that, but have you thought about this? Instead of, God told me, and you're supposed to, that is not in the Bible. It's not found anywhere in the Bible, that type of communication is. Uh, if you're thinking about a Christian friend who you trust and agree with over something you were thinking of, that's confirmation. You know, uh, when, when Jack mentioned something that he would like to move to town, I says, you know, it's funny, I, I was just thinking of that, and then Billy says, well, why don't you apply for a place here? And, and so that's kind of confirmation. I wouldn't go up and say, Jack, God spoke to me, you're supposed to move to Mulvane. Okay, you've got to move to Mulvane. God spoke to me. See how ridiculous that is? How do I know what God is thinking? How do I know what God's will is for his life? So, I want to just point you to a couple of scriptures that kind of show you why I, I feel that this is really, really heavy on my heart. Have you heard of the NAR? The Nat, uh, they call it the, the New Apostolic Reformation. The New Ap Apostolic Reformation is called the NAR. They call this, it's, it asserts. Now, this is the idea between the, some of the Word of Faith, not all Word of Faith churches, but those that claim that God speaks through them and directly, and some of them have even said, Jesus appeared in a vision to me. You know, there's things like that are kind of, I'm not sure which God that was. You know, God can manifest him as an angel of light. Satan can appear as, it may be, oh, that looks like Jesus. That must have been, he said, angel of light. Remember, Lucifer was most beautiful. He was deceived, and he appears as an angel of light to our human eyes. So, John 4.24 says, Worship God in spirit and in truth. That's all I seek to do. If I can't worship Him in truth, then it's worthless. It's useless. This new national apostolic Reformation, Here are, here's their bio. They're naming offices now, of the new offices of prophet, and per, putting a person in as a prophet, and new position of apostle. <coughs> Capital A, new apostles. And I'm thinking, man, I just missed it by that much. I could have been an apostle. I hate labels. Okay, that's the first thing that I don't like labels because it puts pride on the heart. Just call me Jack, call me Pastor Jack. Pastor disaster, hey you, I don't care. I'm not going to be offended. That's just what I'm saying. And Jesus died for the truth. He was full of grace and full of truth. Now this new movement, believe it or not, is largest segment of population within the church of any other movement. If you, if you take out the Catholic Church, it is the largest movement that was moving within the churches in the world. And it's affecting people in Africa. It's affecting people in the Philippines, in India. There's a guy up in, uh, and I can't even pronounce the name of it, but it's, a, it's up there northeast of India. They're hearing this. And they go, well, we have an apostle, and he told us to do this. And I go, did they raise the apostle Paul back to the law? No, he's an apostle sent from God. Okay, who's the authority? Who's, who designated? Every time I see a person saying, well, he's an apostle, I says, who designated him? I look at the Bible and it says, for example, in what they call the fivefold ministry, Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 13, and I'll go through that in a second. In fact, I will draw you a chart now about when there's some of this still remains. And inside here, this is their fivefold ministry. Inside is the apostle. Next is a prophet. Next is evangelist. Next is pastors. And next 
is teachers. This is what they call the fivefold ministry. You've heard of it? Some of you have heard of it? It's, it's fivefold ministry. One, two, three, four. <coughs> I was supposed to be right there. I go, man, I missed it just by that much. No, I didn't. And my first warning sign was, where is this in the Bible? Is the fivefold ministry in the Bible? Actually, it, it's not ever called the fivefold ministry. It is called, it's the foundation. Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 13. And listen to the language of this. And he, who's he? Jesus. Jesus. Who appoints these? It ain't me. I can't go over and lay hands on Sid. Sid, God spoke to me, and he, you're supposed you're the apostle for the Mulvane area. You are the chief of all. I have no authority to do that. Right. I can't do that. I'm going outside of the Bible. So, so here's Apostle Prophet's message. And, and this is actually the foundation of the church. And you see that it is what the way God has structured the church. But they got the, they got the chart wrong. And I'll show you why. And I will go through this here too. In Ephesians 4, 1 through 13. And he gave Greek past tense. See the importance of a word he gave. That if you look at the Greek, it is a past, it's already happened. It has happened. Like Jude said, contend for the faith once delivered. Does that make sense? It's been done one time. Okay, so here is the structure of the, the church. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. God laid that. He, he supports everything. And the funny thing is, that is the apostles and the prophets are built upon that, and it is the foundation. The cornerstone is kind of interesting. Because it's a, it, it goes with, when they put a building up, they put the person's name, or they put the date, or they put information. They might put a time capsule inside of it. And the whole building is identified by the cornerstone. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus is the cornerstone of the whole church. And it says, and I'll, I'll get to that later, and the apostles and the prophets are the foundation. Okay? So now we've kind of got, here are the apostles. And here are, sorry, and here are the, and the prophets. Or they're all sideways. Cornerstone, apostles, prophets. There you got the foundation. <clears throat> That's a good beginning. And he, Jesus, gave, past tense, he gave the apostles, and then he gave the prophets. But it never says the teachers and pastors and all that, they're not part of the foundation. We're building up. Okay, we're going upward. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, the shepherds, or which is pastors. I'm reading Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. What is this for? To equip the saint for the work of the ministry, like Jack is doing, and by seeking and, and reaching out to people and inviting them to church. Uh, like, like all of us have been doing in the last few months, in the last few years. It's for the building up. Notice the word building up. You're going upwards. It's a good idea to go up when you're building. Because if you go down or try to mess with the foundation, adding more cornerstone or, or new blocks of the foundation, you're going to have an unstable structure. You have to remove this, and I'll show you why. It is for the building up of the body of Christ until when? Until we all attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what I'm going for. And it's, I'm struggling with my own self. I'm getting in the way. A lot of times I'm my own worst enemy. So, Supposedly we need the signs of an apostle now that have heard it already that I've got some new revelation. Okay? My answer would be, I've got some new revelation too. And if you go out and run around the building three times, this will happen. And, and then you can't, you know, Oprah Winfrey is queen. Or whatever the case. You can have your own truth, but, if, but it's not the same as truth. You don't have truth. You have your opinion. You can have your own talk show host. And you can be anything. You can be on TV or radio. The signs of an apostle to me, they say, are new revelations of prophets that finally propel the church into glorious. 
uh, kingdom in perfection. We're never going to reach perfection here. So that's kind of what they're doing. The movement claims God is raising up a huge wave of end time prophets and apostles that are instrumental in, in subduing entire nations and eventually the whole world before Christ returns. That's universalism. That ain't going to happen. If the whole world's going to be saved in time, why did Jesus die? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Amen. You know, it, it just makes no purpose. He died for nothing. That's what they... They claim that those who do not submit to this prophet apostolic movement are judged or get out of the way. I was told that, you know, you need to get on board. This is new wine, and, and you're trying to pour new wine into old wine stands. And I said, you know what? Jesus poured new wine 2,000 years ago, and it's just fine. We don't need new wineskins. Thank you. What does that mean? We are going to pour new wineskins. You need to get outside of yourself and think about, this is new wine with new... I don't understand that. I don't even drink wine. You know, for, for nothing. You know, how, where is the authority that where Paul said that we'll be raising up later? And, and I can't find it. Ephesians 2, verses 19 and 20. And here's where we're going to get to where the building. I love Lego blocks. I, when my kids and my grandkids, we built them up and we make these huge towers. I only knock them down. <laughs> this one ain't going to be knocked down by Satan, by man, by false prophets and apostles, by teachers who bring their own agenda in. This is going to survive. And I'll show you why. Actually, the Word will show you why. Ephesians 2, 19 through 20. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, like we were. We were cut off. Isaiah 59, uh, verse 2, we were separated. We were cut off by God, by our sins, okay? Ephesians 2, 19, verse 20. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of, the, of God's household. Interesting word, I'll come back to the household. Having been built, past tense, been Bill, did that, been there, done that, bought the shirt. Okay, it's over. This is important because if we get outside of the context of, of, of the Word of God, uh, then, then we're building with Legos, and it's not going to stand. We're going to knock it down, or God's going to knock it down with His breath of His mouth and judging the world like this sword that comes out of His mouth and is perturbed. We have been being built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus being the cornerstone. The funny thing is about a cornerstone, when they lay cornerstone, I used to work construction. I did some brick for a while and I poured concrete for all in my youth, younger days, many, many years ago, when uh, before radio was color, we had black and white radio. That's way back. That was a bad joke. But the cornerstone is used to align everything, even. And that's what a cornerstone is really used for. They, they, they gauge that this should go this way. That's like a level. You put it here and it's going to have to be level. If it's not, it's not going there. It's not going to work. It's going to fall. So that's the, that's the, I thought I would say that about the cornerstone because I did some research on that. And it's really interesting. They're still laying cornerstones today in new buildings. There. So it's building up. This is the foundation. The passage uses the word, the analogy of building up. Okay, you're not building up. So I'll show you later that there's... Today, this is a 2,000-year-old building, by the way, but it's got a great foundation, and it's got a great cornerstone, and it's not going to fall. It's going to stand forever, and it, it's going to be... So now, today, we are called, as in Peter, and I'll refer to that verse a little later, as we are precious living stones built upon the foundation. And I'll show you why. Or the Bible, again, will show you why. Please forgive me for saying that. My opinion is not very is not, not important. The word in Ephesians 4.11 is from the base of the same Greek root, uh, word used in Ephesians 2.20. Uh, it is, is building up. Here it's saying that is the foundation and we are building up. For 2,000 years, that's going to be pretty high. It's, it's still being built. Here, here is a key phrase. 1 Corinthians 3.11, and this, this makes perfect sense. You'll find these references in the New Testament a, a lot about uh, stones and living stones, and we're part of the structure, we're part of the building, and building, he's building up the church uh, using us. 1 Corinthians 3.11, this is a really key verse. No one can 
lay a foundation other than that which has already been laid. They're wanting to now, they've got all these buildings. 2,000 years they've built, these are members, these are Christians, and not just pastors and teachers. I mean, these are you and I, all of us are members of the body of Christ. Now they're wanting to put another foundation. Oh, we need more apostles. Let's put up another prophet. How about another a prophet just for goodness sake and then an A and another A so we'll have a nice, you know, structure. What happens if you put a foundation up here? It's stable. It's going to fall. And if it's a man-made structure, it's not going to last. This is why this angered me when people come in and presume to speak to me that you are not a pastor, you are something else. And how do you know what my heart, how do you know my God's call? God calls. You don't assign or ascribe something for somebody that you think God spoke to you. How do you know it wasn't that burrito dinner you had last night? How do you know it was not the enemy himself? Satan can masquerade as an angel of light. It makes no sense to put another foundation up here than that which has already been passed and laid. I hope that makes sense to you. The reference to Peter is 1 Peter 2, verse 4 through 5. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. This is a perfect example. You keep hearing these when it talks about members in the body and the church. It's always talking about members and stones and building up. You can't go anywhere down. If you mess with the foundation, the whole thing's going to come down. This is done. I'm not going to try to mess with the foundation. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 5. What a precious... Oh. And I'm going to read in the ESV version just for clarity's sake. I like the King James, but this might make it clear. 1 Peter 2, verse 4 through 5. As you come to Him, Jesus... A living stone rejected by men. Remember, he was the chief cornerstone. It was a stumbling block for all the Jews and non-believers today. They were rejected this. Some now apparently are rejecting it too. Are they going to put a new cornerstone up? Because the cornerstone needs to be giving the level, and this is right, and this is wait. This one's off a little bit. Get that one out of here. See what the cornerstone does for the structure. First Peter two four through five. A living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Here's the part I want. You yourselves are like living stones and being built up a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, to offer sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. The next mention, and I'll turn to Ephesians 3 and I'll show you why. And this is, this is kind of an introduction. Uh, this might be kind of give you an idea because I'll get into more specifics next week or if unless something else comes up and I think, oh, i got to speak on I don't know how. I can't control what's coming next week. <laughs> unless I could say, like they did in the faith word movement, they said, speak to your wallet. Your wife having trouble? Speak to your wife. If the little kid goes into the kitchen, Speak to you, cookie jar, you cookie bur you jar full of big cookies, and he looks in there and it's still empty. That's how the word of faith moves. It starts imitating. I'm not going to speak any word of faith. I'm going to speak the words of faith. And it's right here. Ephesians 3, verse 4 through 5. Now that's really happened. Speak to your wall. We've heard some of that from others. I have no power in my word. I can speak in, and ask for somebody to do something, or I can confess my sins. We have no inherent power to make something happen. I can speak to my wallet, but you know what? It's not even here. What's it going to do? I'm going to have to maybe use your wallet here. <laughs> Ephesians 3, 4 through 6. The next mention of apostles and prophets in Ephesians. Notice Ephesians has a lot to do with this. Yeah, I'm referring to Ephesians a lot. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight. I'm, I'm reading an, an NIV this time because I like the flow. It's almost like the, uh, the Living Bible um, translation. When you read, you can understand. Paul is speaking Ephesians 3, 4 through 6. My insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men. And now it has been revealed to his holy, uh, his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. His. They're his. He designates them that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. 
that is kind of an idea. I kid, again, we, we get the idea that this is something that we don't do. Uh, it's something that I don't do. Uh, it's something that purely comes from God. As in, in Revelation 21, 4, talks about when we see the kingdom, it talks that I find it, the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones in the, kingdom, in the new kingdom of God in the uh, heaven. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles. There are 12 stones, 12 apostles. Guess where they go? Uh, down here. I'm going to put 12 more up here. I'm going to make an unstable uh, building, and, and it's going to fall. So Jesus Christ is called the foundation. It's not laid by man. It was not laid by Paul. It was not laid by the apostles. It was laid by God for the church for all time. It's the foundation, and it would be understood is if the foundation which consists of the apostles and prophets uh, already laid, then how can we lay other, another foundation at the very top? And it just makes, it makes no sense. And I, this is why I'm doing this. This little verse kind of made me think of this uh, when I read this in Jude 1.3 and in Jude 1.17. We can see even with the New Testament, the uh, apostolic teachings that were considered final and authoritative. Jude is a good example, and he says in Jude 1 3, Jude was a half brother of Jesus. He is not converted. Most of his family were not saved until after the resurrection, so for the longest time, Jude was an unbeliever. Uh, he says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, making every effort, must have been some resistance then. He had to make every effort, or he was making every effort to make sure that this truth comes out. I don't know. But either way, he made a lot, he made a great effort, so it must have been important. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. I felt the necessity to write up to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It says, once for all delivered. Okay, I'm FedEx, I went and delivered a package, and I'm done. Well, we need to make sure, let's call UPS this time. Maybe he didn't. Well, that, he's already delivered it. You don't want to go for another delivery. It's at the door. It's like saying, it's, it's like they're ignoring this verse that the faith which was once, and the, the Greek in that is saying, done. I did it one time. Like you can, you can step off a you know, building and die. You're only allowed one mistake. Okay? Watch that first step. Can't do it again. That's the language of the faith was once delivered for all. Now, all is inclusive. That's all in the church delivered to the saints. And finally, in Jude 1, 17, but you, beloved, you ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by our apostles. Every reference to the apostles and prophets were, have been done. It's past tense. There is not even a hint anywhere in the New Testament that points that there will be. Now, there might be offices, like we were talking about. Often you might... Be, you know, that was kind of a, your kind of a gift of prophecy in the New Testament was forth telling, truth telling. It was not predicting the future. There were prophetesses that did that in time, but they already were sovereign will of God. They were not designated as a, I mean, they were designated by prophet, but they was, prophets was not capitalized. Okay, they prophesied. They were not a prophet, proper noun, capital P, or apostles at the same time. So uh, they're ignoring. Church history, if they're trying to put up another foundation. Uh, they're ignoring scripture by, by laying another foundation that's already been on top of that which has already been laid. And I'm not going to take any part. I'm going to distance myself from the group that's tried to ha have me cooperate and go other uh, under this guise of being you're an apostle and, and, and Nick, now you, Jack, and you're a prophet. And, and we're going to reach community because in your fivefold ministry, and this is what God has told us, and he, we have new prophets and apostles, and I see nothing in there at all at the Bible. I absolutely see nothing in there. So it is the faith once delivered. It's not still continuing to be delivered. Pete's had delivers, and yeah, but one time, and they don't keep coming. Well, we had, we got, a manager spoke to me, and I'm supposed to bring you another pizza. See how ridiculous that is when others try to speak outside of the Word of God? You know, they're not going to do it. It's done. It's over. And this is the foundation that laid. And, and I'm not going to refuse to see anybody or accept anybody's teaching that says, we're going to lay another foundation. 
we're going to <coughs> designate more prophets and apostles. And I want you to be in it. God has told me you're the prophet. Chapter and verse. Otherwise, I'm not going to believe it. So next week, I will look into how, how the Bible defines how a person becomes an apostle by the Bible, only by the Bible. How can you confirm and what is an apostle, first of all? Uh, how can you identify apostles? Are there modern day apostles? Same for prophets, are those guys, are they still, is God still doing that 2,000 years later? Or is there evidence in the Bible that that can't be happening? So you decide upon based upon what you hear and the Spirit tells you, and all I'm going to do is show you what the Word of God says. And that's up to you, but I, I'm not, right now, I'm not going to be part of this. This foundation and the cornerstone, it done did. It's over. And I'm not going to try to ever build upon what, which someone else has already been like. Because no man, no woman can lay any foundation, other foundation than that. That we should be laid. Does that make sense? It should be closer. Father, <clears throat> Father God, thank you for the message that Pastor Jack had for us. I pray, Lord, that what he said means that you're spoken through him to us will not fall on deaf ears, that the seed sown will produce what was intended. And continue, Lord, to work with each one of us this week, molding us into being more like Christ. Help us as we go out of here to be the light in a dark world, leading others to, to your glorious grace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. We have a nursing home minister too. Paul may not be able because he's got a truck trouble or something. I'm not sure. Um, at two o'clock. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, also, there's a fundraiser in Belle Plaine at the community center. They're having a fundraiser for uh, Lori Good and her husband Ken. So if you want to go eat.